Hey kiddos, welcome back. Um, today we're going to talk about something called colligative properties. Probably a term you haven't heard of before. Colligative properties are simply physical properties of a solution and they are affected by the number of particles, not the type of particles. Colligative properties include something called vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and something called osmotic pressure. So once again, colligative properties depend upon the number of particles in my, a number of solute particles in my solution, not, not necessarily the type of particles. So the first one we're going to talk about is something called vapor pressure lowering. Now, Experiments show that when I add a non-volatile solute to a solvent, the vapor pressure will lower. Now, first of all, what is a non-volatile solute? You might remember that from an earlier video. Non-volatile means that the intermolecular forces of attraction are so strong that that particular solute does not evaporate easily. They like to stick together, so they don't go into the gaseous phase um, very easily. So when I add a non-volatile solute, let me give you an example of um, sugar, uh, table salt. If I add something like that to water, my pure solvent, it turns out that the vapor pressure of my water will be lowered. The particles that produce vapor pressure, remember, escape the liquid at its surface. When a solvent is pure, its particles occupy the entire surface area. When the solvent contains a solute at the surface, we now have a mix of solute and solvent particles. With fewer solvent particles at the surface, kiddos, fewer particles can enter the gaseous phase. And if fewer particles are entering the gaseous phase, obviously the vapor pressure will now be lower. The greater the number of solute particles in the solvent, the lower the resulting vapor pressure will be. Thus, vapor pressure lowering is due to the mole fraction. Remember mole fraction, folks? Of solute particles in a solution and is considered to be a colligative property. Once again, it depends upon the number of particles, solute particles, not the type. Okay, so maybe a picture of this will help you understand it a bit better. So let's take a look at these two beakers. The beaker on the left is pure solvent. Let's just pretend that that is water. All right, silly question time. What's at the surface of my liquid? What type of particles are at the surface? That's right, just water particles. So they can leave the surface, if they have enough kinetic energy, folks, and enter the gaseous phase. And when they do, those gas particles will exert, as you know, a certain vapor pressure, which is dependent upon the temperature. Now, what if I change that to a solution? So now, let's say I have water and I've added sugar to it. And let's make it 10% sugar. Silly question time. What's at the surface of my liquid? <laughs> we now have water molecules at the surface, and we also have sugar molecules at the surface, don't we? So, sure, there are a lot of water molecules, but then there's a sugar molecule that now takes the place of what used to be a pure water molecule in the previous picture. So, will there be as many water molecules available to leave the surface? No, because there are sugar molecules that have taken their place. So fewer water molecules will enter the gas phase. How many fewer? Well, 10% fewer. So guess what happens to the vapor pressure at that same temperature? That's right. It drops. The vapor pressure will drop by 10% of what it was at that same temperature when I had pure water. Here, let's look at a mathematical um, equation that will help us solve some problems. Mathematically, we end up with P2 equaling P1 times MF1. Well, what do these P's and M's and F's stand for? Okay, well, it's pretty simple. P1 is simply the vapor pressure 
of the pure solvent. Okay, that would be the vapor pressure exerted by uh, this beaker over here. P2 would be the vapor pressure of the solution. So that would be the vapor pressure exerted by this beaker, the second beaker over here. MF1 is simply the mole fraction of the solvent. And so when I multiply the vapor pressure of my pure solvent times the mole fraction of my solvent, I will get a new vapor pressure that will be lower than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Here, let's work a problem. Maybe that'll help us out a bit. Let's do one like the beakers up above. Let's say I had a tenth of a mole of glucose dissolved in two moles of water at 25 degrees Celsius. What is the resulting vapor pressure of the solution? Now, I need to tell you this. The vapor pressure of pure water at 25 degrees Celsius is 24.0 millimeters of mercury. So, help me out a little bit. What will happen to that, to that vapor pressure? Will it be higher? Will it be lower? Or will it be the same? Yeah, if you've been listening, you know that I'm going to get an answer lower than 24 millimeters of mercury because I have a non-volatile solute that's dissolved in my water. So not as many water molecules can escape the surface because there's these glucose molecules that are in the way. Well, let's find out what the mole fraction of my solvent is. Okay, so I have 2.0 moles of water. And remember, mole fraction is the moles of the component you're interested in divided by the total moles of my solution. So I have two moles of pure solvent divided by two moles of water, that's my pure solvent, plus 0 0.10 moles of C6H12O6. So let's see what that mole fraction is. So this is 2.0 divided by the sum of 2.0 and 0.1. So essentially 2 divided by 2.1. And we end up with 0.95. Not to two significant figures. So let's use my equation here. P2, that's what I'm after, folks. The vapor pressure of the solution is equal to P1. That's the vapor pressure of my pure solvent times my mole fraction. So, P2 equals the vapor pressure of my pure solvent, which is 24.0 millimeters of mercury, times the mole fraction of my solvent, which was 0.95, and that will equal, let's see, uh, times 24.0, it looks like to two significant figures, we now end up with a vapor pressure of 23 millimeters of mercury. Hmm. Well, that's lower than the vapor pressure of my pure solvent, isn't it? And that's what we expected. Okay, now it turns out it doesn't make a difference if this is glucose or if it's table sugar. So long as I have 0.1 moles of that substance and two moles of water, the vapor pressure will be lowered by the same amount. So let's try it. What if I had 0 0.10 moles of sucrose? This is table sugar for the same problem. So the mole fraction would be the same, wouldn't it? We'd have 2.0 moles of water still divided by 2.0 moles of water plus 0 0.10 uh, moles of, this time it's C12 H22O11. And that will still equal 0.95, won't it? So P2 will be the vapor pressure of my pure solvent, 24 millimeters of mercury, times the mole fraction of my solvent, which is 0.95. I only have two sig figs in my answer, so I end up with, once again, a vapor pressure of 23 millimeters of mercury. Didn't make a difference if that was glucose or if it was sucrose. It lowered the vapor pressure by the exact same amount. Now, I'm going to complicate things just a little bit for you here. One might think that if I had a tenth of a mole of sodium chloride, 
since the mole fraction of sodium chloride units would be the same, that the vapor pressure would lower by the same amount. Well, this is where things get a little bit tricky. Sodium chloride is ionic, and when that dissolves in water, I get sodium ions and chloride ions. So I end up with twice as many particles at the surface as I did if it was non-ionic. So if it were sugar, I only get one particle per sugar unit. If it's ionic, like sodium chloride, I would get a sodium and a chloride ion out of it. So I end up having, instead of 0.1 moles of solute particles, because I have two particles per mole of sodium chloride units, I end up with a 0 0.20 moles of ions at the surface. So my mole fraction of solute particles will be a bit higher. Okay, so let's do the math now. So here I'd have 2.0 moles of water still. And now I'm going to divide that by 2.0 moles of water plus 0.20 moles of ions. And so my mole fraction is not going to be 0.95 anymore. It's going to be 2 divided by 2.20, which is 0.91. So now my new vapor pressure will be the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, which is 24 millimeters of mercury still, times 0.91, the mole fraction of my solvent. And so 24 times my 0.91 would give me 22 millimeters of mercury. So we end up, when it's ionic, we have to be careful with how many ions are made when those particles dissolve in water. Here, let me do another example for you. What if I substituted 0 0.10 moles of calcium nitrate? Well, here, when that dissolves in water, don't I get a calcium ion and two nitrate ions for a total of three particles? One calcium and two nitrates. So my effective number of moles at the surface would not be 0.1, it would be three times higher than that, it would be 0.3. So now my mole fraction of solvent would be even lower. I'd have 2.0 moles of water divided by 2.0 moles of water plus 0 0.30 moles of ions. And so let's see what that turns out to be. 2.0 divided by 2.30, we end up with 0.87 as my mole fraction. So P2 in this case would be 24.0 millimeters of mercury again, but this time my mole fraction of the solvent is even lower, 0.87. So we end up with a vapor pressure of 21 millimeters of mercury. So it's even lower. So we have to be a little bit careful with these. If it's non-ionic, no big deal. Glucose and sucrose are non-ionic. So they would make just one mole of particles per mole of molecule. But when it's ionic, we have to be a little bit more careful. We have to see how many moles of ions are being made when they dissolve in my solvent. Okay? All right, now we're going to apply this vapor pressure lowering to our next colligative property, which is boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. And we'll talk about that in the next video. So we'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.